the question is, have you convinced yourself that you've endured all that you can? Or have you discovered that you are more resilient than you knew? That you can actually find greater strength in whatever you faced? You can overcome it, you can get past it, you can get through it, and you can actually become a more powerful human being because of it. The goal of the Best You Podcast is to allow you to feel confident about what you need to do, why you need to do it, and how to do it in order to get closer and closer to your best you. All right. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Best You Podcast. I could not be more thrilled to be joined by the one and only Erwin McManus today. Erwin, I just want to start off by saying thanks so much for spending the time with me today. Oh, it's good to be here with you. Yeah. So I had the fortunate opportunity last weekend, actually, it was funny how it all timed out to come see you in person for the first time out there in Hollywood at Mosaic. And it's something that I have really been trying to do or not necessarily been trying to do actively, but I've wanted to do over the last two and a half years since I started digesting your content and digesting Mosaic's content. And I was fortunate enough that Edwin, uh, allowed, our, our mutual friend, allowed me to, to stay with him and come see you. And it was such a powerful experience. And like every single piece of content, video or book that I absorb from you, it's, it's a powerful experience. And so I'm excited for everybody to learn more and, and have that experience today. And the, I think what's really important to know about you and your story kind of leading into it isn't necessarily all about how you're such a renowned speaker, author, pastor now, but it's also about your childhood and, and all of that. And so I know that basically up to age 12, you always felt like a little bit of a misfit and a little bit different. And you ended up in a psychiatric chair at age 12. And I know that you at one night, like ran out into a field and convinced yourself that you were of a different species. And, uh, and you were wondering how I, how to kind of interact with humans. And then, and you always kind of realize now that there was this deep sense of aloneness that you had because you felt very different. You were a, you know, a straight D student, you say up until, uh, up until college, until you kind of started learning about stuff that you really wanted to learn about. And so my question to you is when did you start to feel like you were moving away from that sense of aloneness? When do you feel like you really started to feel like Irwin and that he had a place in this world? Well, that's actually two different questions because when you asked me, when did I start feeling like Irwin? I felt like Irwin when I felt alone. Mm. <laughs> and uh, you don't necessarily feel like you're not yourself. You feel that your true self doesn't, really fit into the world around you. I think a lot of times we spend too much of our lives losing our true self so that we belong and find acceptance. And I, I just, I found in my own life that oftentimes we have to decide whether we're going to uh, choose our uniqueness or, or um, our acceptance. And, and so I think that's a part of the journey that, that, um, that I was on as, as an individual. So I don't know when I would say, quote, I felt connected because there was, there was always someone that there was a sense of connectedness to, you know, and even when I was little, I, I felt connected to my grandparents. And, um, and um, I'm really grateful for the fact that, that I felt a deep sense of affection and acceptance from them. Um, even though they, they, they even told me I was kind of an, uh, an anomaly for them and they couldn't figure out um, who I was and, and, uh, and how I thought. Uh, and then there's those moments throughout life, you know, it's, it, that's why you should never take for granted even passing through someone's life. There's a lot of people that kind of pass through my life and just a few moments of that, of a certain person's life made me feel deep sense of connection. Every time I met someone new, really was becoming their authentic self or really had stepped into their own sense of, um, of self-awareness and, and, um, and selfhood. I think, I feel like those moments really helped me connect uh, deeply, which it also sent me on a pretty deeply spiritual journey, trying to figure out if there was something more to life than just existing. And, and was, you know, were the things that were driving me, were they, were they more intrinsic? Were they, were, 
what was it? My soul was searching for something bigger than me that, that I couldn't explain. And, and so I think it was sort of an intersection of a lot of things. It's really trying to figure out who you are and trying to figure out how to connect to the this bigger thing called life, you know? And, um, and, I, and so I, I feel like I'm still trying to figure that out. Right. Yeah, I think we all are. But I, I really like what you said when you said that we have to decide or we often are kind of faced with the decision subconsciously and or consciously to choose our uniqueness or choose acceptance from others. And I think that's really, really important. What do you think allows somebody to choose their uniqueness over acceptance from others? Because I think a lot of people don't take the time to define success from their for themselves. And if they feel like others are not willing to accept that, they'll easily go towards the path of acceptance rather than the path of uniqueness. So what does it take for somebody to be able to choose uniqueness over acceptance, if you will. Yeah, I think even the way you define success can uh, be a, a dangerous process because if if success is really about how other people perceive you, how other people measure your worth, your value, uh, you're, you're really trapped inside of the perception of other people. And, and I think it's really important to um, go through a process where you live your life less and less out of obligation and more and more out of intention. And I think some of it is really a discovery. You know, when you're a kid, um, you're you're living the life that other people expect you to live. They're, you're trying to figure out how to be loved by your parents or your family or to be accepted and valued by teachers and your peers and your schoolmates. And, and, uh, and then all that changes when you change grades. If you move a lot, I moved a lot. So every time I felt like I'd gotten I made some progress. I had to start all over again. And then, you know, you go through high school and then you get out of high school and you go into a new structure if it's college. And, and most of us spend our lives trying to be accepted by whatever system we want to succeed in. And I think a huge part of it is really making sure that your measurements for success are more internal rather than external, more driven by uh, becoming the person that you are designed to be rather than what other people, um, you know, tell you, you should be. And, and that can be from really significant things where I know a lot of people that they become doctors because their parents wanted them to become doctors or lawyers or dentists or, or teachers, or whatever it is, their career was chosen for them by their parents. And, and a lot of times that's the way they feel about even like their life, their, their lifestyle, their values, their, um, uh, you know, their, their priorities are not things they actually took on for themselves. There are things that they felt were imposed on them. I think you have to kind of go through a personal revolution, maybe more than once, where you step back and ask yourself, what really matters to me? You know, do, do these beliefs matter to me? Do these values matter to me? Are these the priorities of my life as I choose them is um, does this reflect my intention for my life? And the longer I've lived my life, the more I feel like I've aligned my life where I live a life of intention rather than a life of obligation. Mm. That's, that's really good. I like when you said that a lot of people will align their definition of success to fit in the success of the system that they're in. I think that's so true. I, I think that the, Best for one of the things that I've truly believed deep down, and I'm interested to get your thoughts on it, is that the best version of yourself is someone that is both discovered and created. And one of the things I'm sure you've heard Ed Milet talk about is he kind of has this fantasy that when he goes to heaven, God is going to introduce him to the version of him that he was meant to become. And his goal is that they're the exact same person. His biggest fear is that they're complete strangers. And so I, I really do believe that there's this combination of who we should be and who we could be. Who we should be, meaning God created us with certain geniuses, certain gifts that are unique to us. But at the same time, like you like to say, we are created in God's image. And if God is the ultimate creator, then he, cr he created us to create as well. And so we can create who the best version of ourselves is. So riff a little bit on the idea that I presented. That's my kind of opinion that the best version of ourself is somebody who we maybe should be and could be or discovered and created. I'm not sure what you're asking me though, but I do agree with everything you said, because it sounds 
very much like what I wrote about in Artist and Soul and, uh, and, and understanding that we're, humans are intrinsically designed, uh, created to create, designed to design, imagined to imagine. And um, I, I, I think some of it is when I, I don't really sit around and think to myself, if, you know, am I going to at the end be the, the best version of myself? I, I, I just feel like that's so elusive in some ways that I don't even know what the best version of me looks like. You, you know, I just want to live fully present today, it, it, you know, and because I think that if we're always trying to be the best version of ourselves in the future, we may miss out on the wonder and beauty of this moment. Mm -hmm. and, and so there's a, there's a part of me that feels really comfortable with letting the best version of myself emerge out of being fully alive each day yeah. and being, you know, the, the best version of myself in this moment and, um, you know, being the best husband to Kim and the best father to um, our, you know, our kids and, and, you know, making the, the biggest difference I can in the world and trying to do the most good I can and to live a life of risk and courage and creativity and, and adventure and and just sort of let it come you know because even becoming the best version of yourself can almost feel like a burden you know and uh, because um you're going to live a life of imperfection you are never going to be in a sense the full version of you because you're never going to stop growing you're never going to max out all of your potential you're never going to wake up one day and go, wow, I finally arrived. I finally used all my genius, all my talent, all my potential, all my gifting. I'm finally there. And because if you ever got there, that means you would be static. <laughs> and that you would not be limited. And, 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 and so I think, you know, we live in an ever-expanding universe. And I don't think the universe is worried and about reaching its full potential. <laughs> I think just keep growing, keep expanding, keep developing, keep loving more and dreaming more and risking more and then enjoy the process. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree more. I always talk about how the best version of yourself is not somebody that you ever end up becoming. It's just kind of potentially an ideal to live by, but it also, as you've kind of touched on, it depends on how you define what the best version of yourself is because I don't, I try not to let the best version of myself and, and chasing down that person be a burden. I'm not, <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm not letting that be something that always stresses me out because I'm not that person yet. What I kind of have described it as for, for me personally, the definition that I come up with, have come up with is the best version of yourself is the version of you who is most competent and reciprocal. The version of you who can solve the greatest number of problems and take advantage of the greatest number of opportunities, both for yourself and for others. That's kind of what I have come up with it. And to me, it's funny when, uh, probably a few months ago, when I was listening to a guy named uh, Jordan Peterson, I, I, I kind of realized in my in my viewer and, and with that definition, I almost felt like that was Jesus. I almost felt like Jesus is the person who is infinitely competent, but he always was reciprocal with all of the competence that he had. Um, so anyways, that's the way that I look at it. Yeah. I just, I, I just think the best version of you is going, give yourself a break. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the best version of you is actually far more empathetic and kind and loving and understanding and patient and um you, you don't want to miss out on enjoying life yeah you, you know yeah. and <laughs> like, like to me the best version of me is enjoying life to the fullest it's you know i i i want to optimize my capacity uh not because i'm really worried about leaving something off the table but because um, I, I want to do the most good I can with my life. And I know that if I become the best version of myself, I'm also leaving the best imprint in human history. Yeah. If, 
if one of the things that the best version of yourself means to you is being able to enjoy, enjoy everything in this moment and be truly present with the people that you are around. I know that that's a big struggle that a lot of people go through is being present with the other people that you're around. What are the different things that allows you to do that at, at a high level to be really present and, and enjoy the moment? Yeah, you know, I was at this event where I guess all the participants, their companies had to minimally make a hundred million dollars a year. And they all paid about a hundred thousand a year to be in there. And I remember when I was speaking to them, I said, Hey, I'm not going to tell you how to make more money because you already make more money than me. <laughs> I am going to tell you how not to die alone. <laughs> and one of the things that you begin to realize is that um, there is no scale of success that exempts a person from the real challenges of being human. Those, those challenges are there no matter how much money you have, no matter how successful you are. Uh, no matter how big your company grows or um, how big your house is or how many airplanes you have, I, I actually think the, the, the highest level of success is living your life with genuine, authentic, and healthy relationships. And when you live in, in, uh, in a healthy um, ecosystem of human beings, you actually are happy. You, are actually, you actually are most fulfilled. And my wife and I, when we were first married, we slept on the floor because we couldn't afford a bed. And we didn't feel unsuccessful. And we were definitely very happy. And we were loving life. And what's really nice is when you find meaning in life and you find a way to enjoy life fully. And then you create other levels of success because then um, the wealth doesn't you're not dependent on the wealth for your happiness. So that the wealth is just something on top of the foundation of your of your happiness, of your fulfillment, of the meaning in your life. So everything for me is sort of icing on the cake. Success is icing on the cake for me. Yeah, yeah it's not the cake. Yeah, the, the, I love that, and I think one of the things that I'm curious about. Then you know, if you, uh, I had heard that you guys had uh, slept on the bed on a floor, and and that's amazing that you were able to have your definition of success be internal at the time and not and not feel like you weren't successful at that time. And I think that's really important for all of us to, to remember. As you have gained more of what society maybe deems as success, the, the external success, have you ever found yourself defining success more externally rather than internally as you've gained more of maybe that external success and how have you maybe pulled yourself back if so? Yeah, I think the people that get pulled away by like wealth or power or fame, um, they're the people that really were not grounded before those things came. Mm. And that's why with a lot of professional athletes, with a lot of artists, uh, musicians, they become famous by the time they're 18, successful by the time they're 21, millionaires by the time they're 23. And so they haven't established um, the right foundation from which they can handle that level of success. And, um, and so maybe in that sense, I was really fortunate. You know, uh, the first 10 years of our marriage, we worked mostly with the urban poor. Uh, we um, chose not to take uh, much of an income. I never made more than almost fifteen thousand dollars a year for the first ten years, and 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 I never thought of myself as unsuccessful because everything I wanted to accomplish, I was accomplishing. Everything I set my mind to, I was doing. And I actually remember the day I came home um, over a decade after we were married. I told my wife, "Is you know, I'm a person of of deep faith and." I said, you know, I think that God has given me permission to go create wealth. And my wife was an orphan. She lived in a foster home from the age of eight to 18. Um, she grew up in extreme poverty. And when I told her that, she goes, you can create wealth. <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah, I've always been able to. I've just chosen not to. <laughs> and, uh, and our lives turned upside down. And, and it was really interesting 
Because I think a lot of times people think, oh, if you don't have the yacht or if you don't have the airplane, it's because you're not capable of it. Sometimes it's just not a person's goal. And But at that time in our life when um, we had bigger dreams and bigger ambitions and it was going to take a lot of resources to make that happen. And I couldn't find anyone or any people who really believed in what we saw. So I couldn't find outside financing. So I realized I've got to go create the wealth to create the things that I want to create. And so really for me, it was never about how do we get more money? It was how do we make a greater impact? And every time my dreams and Kim's dreams have gotten bigger, I mean, Kim's been building a school in Malawi. She's been working um, with uh, refugees in Ukraine. She's been, you know, she built a school in Bangladesh and working with women leadership in India. And every time my wife takes on a project, I've got to become more creative. <laughs> I've got to become more inventive. I have to become more resourceful. I have to make more money because my wife, uh, when she's creative, she just thinks of how to spend it. <laughs> and I can tell you, my, my wife would buy her shoes from Walmart. She does, it doesn't matter how much money we've ever made. My wife is still a Walmart girl. She's still a Target girl. And she's just always going to be that person. But boy, can she move millions of dollars to solve human problems and alleviate human suffering. And so I have to become inventive because my wife is so passionate about the things that are um, happening across the world. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. That's good for her. Good for her for being able to stay. Like you said, she had that foundation. So when uh, the time came, she, um, she was always the same person and it, and it didn't change her. The fact that maybe more money was coming in. Um, one of the things that I think you talked about this past Sunday was the importance of being trustworthy to yourself. And I think that's such an important thing that a lack of, or that a lot of people lack is that sense of self trustworthiness that if they say they're going to do something, they're going to do it. And they say they're going to do something, they're going to, they're going to follow through with it. What do you, what do you think it takes for somebody to be able to follow through at a higher level with the things that they know they should be doing, but maybe they're not doing, because I think a lot of people have these things that they know they should be doing, but they're not doing it. So what, what allows people do you think follow through at a higher level? We'll be back to the interview in just a second. But first I wanted to share a quick testimonial from a past participant of the 10 week transformation program. I started running the 10 WT in the beginning of 2020 and I've had over 150 people on counting go through it. And they've seen amazing results both inside and out. If you're inspired to join after listening to the testimonial, then go to nickcarrier.com to learn more. We'll get back to the episode in just a minute, but first, here's what they had to say. Hi, I'm Hillary, and I joined the 10-week program for overall fitness goals to work on weight loss and just overall well-being goals. So far, I've lost 12 pounds. Uh, I've gained a lot more muscle. I feel like my endurance has increased, and I've made a lot of new friends. And my favorite thing about the program is all the friends that I've met also, just holding myself more accountable in different areas of life. I feel like I've improved in nutrition, fitness, and just well-being. You should join the next 10-week program. Well, one of the things that comes to mind right away is that you cannot uh, believe that you're exempt from pain. Because everything that um, is worth doing that is significant will re require some level of pain. I mean, greatness never happens without sacrifice. And so if you have any, any dream, any aspiration, any vision that is bigger than yourself, it's going to cost you something. And I, and I, and I think sometimes we think, oh, the, the person who really achieves it is the big dreamer. And it's not true. There are people who are bigger dreamers than them who simply were not willing to take on the level of sacrifice necessary to achieve those dreams. And I just think it really practical matter for me. I'm like, I'm almost 64. I, I mean, I can literally go from head to toe and tell you what's been broken on my body. And I've had so many injuries, so much damage uh, to my body that my, my body hurts just moving. And, but even like today, um, I went and, you know, I have a trainer, I go work out and I never want to, you know, I, mean, I, I, I never think to myself, oh, I'm ready for this level of pain. And, uh, uh, and then, and in fact, today I told uh, Noel, my trainer, I said, you know, your occupation carries with it a level of darkness 
<laughs> because of the level of pain that you're willing to inflict on other people. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and I was just, you know, teasing her, but uh, it's hard, it's difficult, um, but I have goals and I have promises to myself. And, and those promises that I make to myself require a level of discipline, a level of commitment, a level of sacrifice, and a willingness to, to endure pain. And I, I don't think we end up talking enough about that because we, you know, we live in a culture where we talk about pursuing your dreams and going after your passions. And, and uh, you know, if you can dream it, you can do it. And, and you know, we have all this aspirational language and no one really takes time to go, oh, and by the way, it's going to cost you. You're going to have to get up earlier and go to bed later and um, if you want to work 40 hours a week, work for someone else. But if you're going to work for yourself, you're probably going to work 80 hours a week. You might work 100 hours a week because when it's your baby and it's your dream and it's on your shoulders, you end up working two, three times harder than everyone else. And and I, I think this is that's why this past week I was talking about um, keeping the promises that we make to ourselves. It's, it's not just the promises we make to God or to other people, but the ones we make to ourselves. Because I think so oftentimes we don't hold ourselves accountable for the things that we want to accomplish in our life. Forget what every, anyone else says. Forget what anyone else says you should accomplish in your life. What are the things that are essential to you? What are the things that really matter to you? What are the things about who you want to become as a human being that that are important to you. And then you have to step back and go, what's the price? What's the cost of achieving this? And, and so for me, uh, being a, um, a world-class writer and communicator mattered to me. And so I've, I paid the price to develop the art of communication. I paid the price to learn how to become a, a writer. And, uh, and then when people go, oh, you know, how did you end up with that career? Well, there was a lot of hard work behind that, you know, and so I can write a book fast, but it's because of 40 years of deliberate learning and discipline in my life. And a lot of people want your life. They don't want your, your process, you know, and uh, uh, they don't want to pay the price you paid uh, to experience the level of success you experienced. I, I, I don't know how to tell a person to achieve the success I've achieved without a path that has the same level of sacrifice. Yeah, I think I think that is so key. And I remember this past Sunday, you got really passionate about when, passionate when you were talking about this topic. A lot of people, when they experience some stress or some anxiety, it, it is unexpected. And, and you got really passionate about who told you it was going to be easy? Who told you that this thing was going to come without stress-free, anxiety-free, and all that kind of stuff. And I think that is just like a really thing to, really good thing to check in with ourselves, to remind ourselves of the, that we need to be, step into humility and realize this thing is not going to come pain-free. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people quit from pursuing their particular intention, like their dream, their vision, their, their goal, because it got harder than they expected. And I think for me, I always expected to be hard. In fact, I expected to be so hard that it will be almost unbearable to me. You know how whenever you go to the doctor or PT or something and they say on a scale of one to 10, how much this has hurt? Yeah. I always tell them, I said, I have no idea because I don't know <laughs> what a four feels like or an eight feels like. And so I'm always going to say something like three or four, even if I'm about to black out. Because I assume the amount of pain my brain says I can take is nowhere near the actual amount of pain I can actually endure. And, and I, I've, I've faced this so many times in my life. I mean, I got hit head on by a car running across a highway when I was 19 years old. I was paralyzed from the waist down. And I crawled myself out of that hospital bed, down the hallway to a bathroom, pushed myself up a toilet to make myself stand. And I've wondered so many times in my life, and I didn't know I actually broke my neck. I only found out years later. 
if I had not been willing to press against that pain, I, I, I wonder to this day if I would still not be able to walk. And I, I, I can tell you there's, there are so many things in life that the amount of pain you'll experience will tell you this is, this is your limit. This is your wall. This is your boundary. Don't press past this. Um, I treat pain as a liar. Mm -hmm. I, I, I find to me that I feel pain way before I've hit my threshold. And, um, and I think it's true even with emotional pain, psychological pain, um, not just physical pain. A lot of people, when they go through trauma, they're paralyzed for the rest of their lives. And when you listen to their story, it's traumatizing. But you know, Nick, I'm an immigrant from El Salvador. I never knew my real father. My, my mom had to leave me with my grandparents uh, to raise me for the first few years. So when my mom came back to me, she was a stranger. My mom remarried a guy that was involved in evidently organized crime. I lived with an alias all my life. Uh, I would have every reason to live my life under the weight of all that trauma. And, and I'm, I'm not even going into the actual trauma. I'm just giving the big picture of what was there. It wasn't one thing that sent me into a, psychiatr into a psychiatrist chair, you know, by the time I was in sixth grade. It was an onslaught of emotional barrages that a child should not have to deal with. And, and yet the reality is we all face pain. And, and we, it's a rare person who doesn't have to overcome trauma. And the question is, have you convinced yourself that you've endured all that you can? Or have you discovered that you are more resilient than you knew? That you can actually find greater strength than whatever you faced? You can overcome it. You can get past it. You can get through it and you can actually become a more powerful human being because of it. And I feel like that's a part of my message is that I never thought it was going to be easy because life was hard from day one. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people, they had a kind of a little bit of a soft entry. And then when they moved toward adulthood, they didn't know it was going to be hard. And so I'm just trying to destroy the myth that greatness can come without hard work. Mm. That's really solid. That's really solid. When I was, um, man, that's good. When I was listening to, I had listened to it a long time ago, but I was listening to it yesterday to, to rewatch the Ed Milet podcast. I just love that one you did with him. He, he said something that, he was like, I always tell people that I don't think anybody could love any love somebody more than I love my two daughters. And he's like, to know that there's a Lord, there's a God that loves me even more than that is a very comforting and empowering thing and a confidence builder for him. And then the thing I kind of had thought about is as a any good parent, once some struggle, once some pain from their child so they have the chance to learn and grow from it. And I feel like the same is true for our Lord, our God, is he wants us to experience the pain and he wants to experience this, that struggle so that we have the chance to, to learn and grow and, and mold from it. And so I just love the message of it's supposed to be, so there's we're exposed to to experience pain. So don't be surprised when it comes to you. Yeah, I don't think God's a masochist. I don't think God intended for this <laughs> world to be filled with pain. I just think that God's a realist and mm -hmm. he knows that there's pain in this life. And so he doesn't give us a way around it. And that's where I think sometimes people get confused, get confused because, you know, I'm a follower of Jesus. And, um, and for a long time, it seemed like people would say, you know, give your life to Jesus and it's all going to be okay. You know, as if give your life to Jesus and there's no pain, there's no suffering, there's no disappointment, there's no failure. And I've read the Bible through and through many, many times. I can tell you that promise isn't there. In, in fact, if anything, the promise is 
if you follow Jesus, life's going to be hard, but you're going to live for um, a more noble cause. You're going to have a deeper meaning and intention in your life, and you're going to find the resilience and strength to make it through whatever you have to go through. And that to me is a, that is a more powerful message of faith that you are stronger than you know, and there's nothing that you'll ever face that can stop you from living the life that you were created to live. That's good. That's good. Well, I want to make sure I get you out of here on time. I have, I'll have one more question, but before that last question, I just want to acknowledge you, Erwin, because you have been such a positive influence and have made such a positive impact on my life, but obviously thousands and millions of others as well. And just from this podcast today, you have inspired me to be more thoughtful with the words that I use and more thoughtful with how I communicate because you know, like, for example, that last part that I was saying is God wants us to experience pain. But then you said, you know, God is not a masochist. Is a, he just is a realist. And 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 because it, that can be an interpretation of, of what I said. And there was a couple of things before, too, that I'm like, you know what? He's challenging me right now to really be careful and intentional with my words, which is awesome. And that's your thing. And so I'm excited to get the art of communication when I uh, when I have the time to when I want to uh, prioritize the time to do that. So. I just want to acknowledge you for all the work that you've done and for uh, holding me to a higher standard with my own communication. I was just very softly trying to navigate the language of the conversation. <laughs> well, and it, even even though even the whole best version of yourself thing, I, I need to be very thoughtful with how I communicate that to others and the the journey of the best version of yourself to others because. I don't want it to be seen as something that is burdensome from people who digest the content that I put out. No, I, I love your intention and I love your heart. And yes, uh, you have to realize that words are, are like a, a, an art form for me. Yeah. And so what we, what we say and how we say it is so important. And, and all of us are on a journey to learn how to communicate the things that matter to us in a way that helps that help other people. And, uh, and and the fact that you do a podcast, it just it takes so much courage and so much risk because you're you're having to think at the top of your head and you're working to help people and and, and believe me, people hear the intention and uh, even when we get the words a little bit off, people know our hearts and and they know your heart. So I just want to encourage you in that. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Well, I know everybody, if they don't follow you yet, then they're going to want to go learn more. So make, make sure you guys go to follow him on Instagram at Erwin McManus on Instagram. Make sure you go listen to a lot of the stuff on YouTube from Mosaic and his most recent book, The Genius of Jesus is out and it is life changing. You will absolutely love uh, reading it along with some of his other books as well. Uh, is there any other good way for people to go learn more about you and, and support you? Um, you know what? Check out the art of communication, and uh, it's probably the most important um, learning process I've created in my uh, 63 years uh, here on this earth. I think that uh, um, the most powerful skill a human being can ever attain is the ability to communicate effectively, to translate their vision, their values, their passion, their dreams and ideas uh, to others, because that's really how life change happens. Awesome. Yeah. The art of communication. I'm looking forward to diving into that myself. Uh, I want to real quick, I want to get you out of here on time. The last, last question is you, you can take it and run with it how you want because, uh, because of the conversation up to this point. But I believe that getting closer to the best version of yourself is a constant journey. I don't think we ever get to that person. And I also kind of, as we discussed today, I think it's a unique journey. I think the way that I get closer to whatever I define as the best version of myself is going to be a little bit different than the way that you get closer to however you define the best version of yourself. So the question is, if there are three things that you could personally do or personally work on to get closer to that best version of Erwin McManus that you could possibly be, then what are those three things that you could currently do or currently work on? Well, the first one would be, I want my 28 year old body back. <laughs> Because uh, the current version of my body uh, cannot live up to my expectations. <laughs> and, uh, so we, we have to realize that the best version of us has to adapt with every phase of our life. And so you can't even hold yourself accountable 
to be who you were 28 or 38 or 48. And some things will be deeper and some things will be more limiting. And that's the reality. And, and that's why, you know, as much as I, I really not only believe, but I love being healthy, physically healthy. It just, it just changes everything. It gives you more energy. It, it, it just, um, it, it, your whole posture and the way you live life is dramatically different. Uh, but deepening your soul, um, elevating your consciousness, thinking at, at, a, at a deeper and more profound level, those are the things that no matter um, how much your body breaks down, you can keep growing in. And, you know, so to me, like the three things that I really want to do is I want to be able to uh, leave behind everything I've learned for generations to come so that the things that I've learned are not lost with uh, my last breath. Those, and that's why I do things like the art of communication is I want to make sure that my life doesn't end with me. It ends with the impact and influence I've had in other people's lives. And I don't really know if I have another two, you, you know, that, that, I think that, I think, I think that's all encompassing. I think that's a, uh all encompassing. So uh, that was great. And I know people are going to absolutely love that. So if you guys are interested in being better communicators, make sure you go to the, uh, go research and, and learn about and, and digest the art of communication and make sure you follow Erwin on Instagram at Erwin McManus. But Erwin is an absolute thrill and pleasure today. I really appreciate you, join, uh, you joining and appreciate your time. Hey, thank you so much for having me. It was an honor. And uh, here's to your best too.